Pantelis Rosakis. Just as the web transformed music and print, social media transformed marketing, digital currencies are going to set to transform finance in the way we use money. Now, I'll stop for a moment before I go into my rave and just define what money is. Money is a signal. It's a signal for human interaction. And I give you money, I offer you money, you do something in return. Otherwise, the paper and the metal, it's pretty useless. You can't eat it, you can't use it for anything, you can't make any clothing out of it. It's only what we agree that it can be exchanged for, that it's actually relevant for. Now, we started using metal <coughs> as money about 5,000 years ago. The Lydians printed the first coins in gold, um, about 700 BC. And the Chinese were using printed money in about 960 AD. And what we know is that money allows for the function of society. That's the magic of money, and it's really good. <coughs> but it needs to have some certain qualities to work. Um, the first quality is scarcity. You can't have it growing on trees, otherwise it can't be a reliable signal. If it is scarce, it can be that signal, that reliable signal for the universal interaction. Um, it needs to be portable. You can be able to pass it around and have it in your pocket. It's a lot easier than seven or eight camels. And it needs to be durable. You can't have it being destroyed after a couple of transactions or after a machine wash. It needs to be divisible, so you can give parts of it. And it needs to be uniform, so we know that you know, that version of the money is the right version at any one time. And lastly, but not least, it needs acceptance. We as a society have to agree that it's worth the same thing. So, <clears throat> my relationship with money started as a young child, three and four. I, was, uh, used to, I learned to count by counting the money in my parents' cash register at the cafe at the end of the day, which was a really enjoyable experience, learning to count that way. But my first real lesson in money, trust, came when I was about 10. My parents moved to Canberra and they wanted to purchase a house. So they often went to the bank with their deposit and collateral and hope to get a loan. And one of the things they had in their collateral was a uh, life insurance policy that my father had been paying into for a number of years. But upon investigation, the bank realised that the insurance company had gone bust, the money was gone, the policy was worthless. And I thought to myself, well, that's not a very good thing. How can you trust other people with your money? Because what seems to happen is that once money starts to accumulate in a sizable amount, little voices go off in people's heads and tell them to do bad things. <laughs> my second lesson in money came in 1974. I was 14. My mother took my brother and my sister and myself across to Greece to visit where we came from the first time, Samos, on the eastern side of Turkey. There we are there on the donkey. And we were there for a few weeks and Turkey invaded Cyprus. And even though Turkey, uh, Cyprus isn't part of um, Greece, Greece went into an all-war footing. Everything went into lockdown, no ships, no transport, everything stopped. And on the Friday, you could go down to the little local store, which was just something next to that building there, and buy a dozen eggs for 50 drachma. But on Monday, those same eggs were 500 drachma. And but what had happened? The value of the eggs hadn't gone up. I mean, if anything, they'd decayed as a perishable item. They would have reduced over the weekend. <laughs> the money was devaluing against the food. And within a few days, the money was almost worthless against buying fresh food. And I thought, well, that's not very comforting, that the circumstances on the ground are changing the value of the money. I mean, this thing that everybody without exception revolves their whole life around was actually quite feeble and fragile. <coughs> so it bothered me, it bothered me so much that in the course of my life I never took out insurance policy except for the mandatory vehicle ones. I steered clear to the banks where possible. I used contra deals and barter to uh, negotiate a lot of my major uh, purchases. And a few years later the internet arrived and that changed everything as we know. But it didn't change the money. And so a, um, some people cleverer than I put some thought to the idea well, about the money and the why, why it was so fragile and manipulated. And in 2008, 
a obscure programmer under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nag Nagamoto, um, presented a white paper um, and with this statement at the start, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Imagine a global currency for the internet where you don't need a bank, you don't need a credit card, you don't even need a physical address to gather wealth. Well, of course, Satoshi was labelled as a crackpot straight away by the financial institutions, but he kept working. And in 2009, on the 3rd of January, he introduced or unleashed the Bitcoin program. And that was the first digital currency. And since then, a number of other currencies came into being. They're also known as cryptocurrencies or virtual currencies. We have Litecoin, we have um, Namecoin, Chinacoin, there's a whole range of them. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on Bitcoin because it was the first digital currency. All the rest are essentially mimics of that first implementation. <coughs> so what is it? Bitcoin is a program. It's a standalone free app download onto a computer like Solitaire. There's no governments, no servers, no companies. It communicates with other Bitcoin programs across the internet to basically keep its ledger and transaction list updated. That ledger is known as the blockchain. Now the blockchain is a bit like a building, like a skyscraper. And workers, known as miners in Bitcoin slang, collect and verify transaction information they lay that information out, if you like, on the floor of the building, and when the floor is complete, a Bitcoin is issued, and they're paid, and then they move on to the next floor. There's no human involvement in this process. No people are involved in interfering with it. You can't change it. And so it just proceeds on its own accord. So to gain wealth in digital currency, work has to be done. Energy has to be expelled. You get paid in Bitcoin or Litecoin, as opposed to our current system where money and wealth is generated by other people going into debt. Now, Bitcoin is money. A number of judgments in Europe and the USA recently have confirmed it, but we don't need financial institutions or governments to endorse it because it ticks off all those boxes I mentioned before about what money is. Scarcity, the scarcity is inbuilt in Bitcoin. Um, there are, only, there are only going to be 21 million Bitcoins issued. The last one will be issued in 2040, and they're issued at a rate of approximately one every 10 minutes. <coughs> now, because the number of coins is set, because the, number of distribution, the amount of distribution is set, so is the rate of inflation. And so on the day the last Bitcoin is issued, it reaches a zero inflation rate and remains there, and remains there uh, forevermore. Bitcoin is divisible, and digital currencies are divisible down to eight decimal places, so giving a fraction or a part of a Bitcoin is not a problem. They're portable. You can keep an electronic wallet in an SD card or a thumb drive or your phone and plug it into the network to update its transactions or use it. They're uniform. Because they don't physically exist, they're only ever expressed as numeric characters. And Bitcoin and digital currencies have one more item which make them just transcend traditional money. In fact, this one element makes Bitcoin the most, the best performing currency investment on planet Earth today. Self-regulation. What does that mean? The technology is the regulator, not a bank, not some set of individuals, but <coughs> Um, sorry. Yeah, so it, it, it's a bit of like a techno-anarchist. And as we said before, uh, Bitcoin and digital currencies are created by people doing work and expanding energy. And so over the years, people have applied faster, bigger, and smarter computers to the, in the aim of producing Bitcoins at a faster rate. Well, Satoshi thought about this and said, that automatically and periodically the Bitcoin program assesses the, com the sum total of computing power being applied to the problem and adjusts its difficulty accordingly. It's a Bitcoin rig, sorry. Yeah. Adjusts the difficulty accordingly. So at no time between now and 2040, Bitcoins would be produced or deviate from the predicted rate. So 
in 2010, the price of a Bitcoin was about three or four dollars. And it even peaked at $30 somewhere in, the, in 20, um, 2011. But even that, at that price, Bitcoin, the amount of energy and electricity required to generate a Bitcoin was worth more than the Bitcoin. And so it remained the realm of geeks and nerds who built elaborate mining rigs and worked with it. And, but in June this year, leading up to June this year, the price of Bitcoin went to $260 US. Now a lot of those geeks, cashed out tens of thousands of coins and became multi-millionaires overnight. And why not? I mean, they'd kept the faith, they'd been Satoshi's disciples, they'd been out there spreading the word to anybody who would listen. And only two years before, they were paying something like $10,000 for a pizza delivery, 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza delivery. <clears throat> now, Cyprus features again in my story, because late last year, the people in Cyprus woke up to the Western world's worst nightmare. The banks were shut, no ATMs, no internet banking, no FPOS. The central bank had run out of money. And this caused a lot of problems for several days for normal people. Until the European Union threw a million euro in cash on an unmarked Airbus and sent it down to Cyprus to fill up the stocks and start business again. And that just underlines the precarious nature of this financial system that we rely to feed and house us. <coughs> So then there's the unbanked. Over 60% of the people in this world don't have a bank account. They don't have enough money for a bank to make it worthwhile to offer them a service. And ironically, the people who get robbed the most in this world are the poor because they've got the money on them or in their homes and the thieves know it. And so digital currencies are set to solve these problems. The problem of who do I trust with my money? I mean, I'd rather trust the internet than a banker or an insurance broker. I mean, I've got more faith in an algorithm to set the value of my money than some set of individuals who really have no interest in my welfare. So the, the acceptance of Bitcoin is becoming wider and wider. WordPress, web hosting, online games, even real estate. The number of businesses that are accepting digital currencies as an alternative to traditional money is growing every day. I imagine that in a very short time, countries aren't going to be able to trust each other to value their currencies fairly. And so this is where digital currencies and bitcoins are going to become a reliable and secure way of generating global interaction and cooperation. So digital currencies are here to stay, they're reliable, they're robust, they allow for the transfer of money without the involvement of a financial institution and without the involvement of someone else getting involved in your transaction. In Bitcoin we trust. Thank you very much. Go forth and prosper.